Now, we finally got to England. Well, we flew, up, well, it's another experience. Well, we, we flew, we had to land at Libya. And after Libya, we had to fly over part of South, America, uh, South uh, Afri of Africa in order to get to French Morocco. And it was a mountain range that we had to cross. And because we had no facilities to fly any higher than about 14 or 15,000 feet, we had to find a pass in a mountain range. Well, this was all new to us. We never flew near any mountain ranges or anything like that. And believe me, it's scary when you fly in a mountain range for the first time and not know where you're going. We were just told to fly certain headings, and you got mountains on either side of you, which look like they're much too high for you to be able to get over, and they were about 18 to 20,000 feet high, from what I understand. And they told us we had to fly at a certain distance until all of a sudden we'd look off to our left and we'd see a dip in the, in the mountains and we'd take that mountain pass, which was 9,000 feet high. And we were flying at about 10 or 11,000 feet. And we just kept flying and flying and began to get jittery and so forth. And all of a sudden, sure enough, we looked off to the left and there's that pass and went right through and got to Casablanca. And then finally we got to England and we signed up and we joined up the uh, joined all, up with all the other airplanes and we were assigned for combat duty and our first mission was the 20th of April 1944. Now uh, the missions that we flew were mainly over France, northern France, north of, north of, uh, of uh, the area which I don't know if, how familiar you are you with, with, the, with what the uh, beaches were D-Day and so forth. It was between the Cherbourg Peninsula and the Calais area. And we just kept bombing that area, tearing up marshalling yards, railroad yards, and uh, trying to disrupt all the communications and the supplies that the Germans would have over there. And we were going after uh, pillboxes and, and uh, armament, uh, you know, all kinds of armament and so forth. And our missions were mainly for bridges and marshalling yards, as I said, and railroads. Now, one, there was one place in particular south of, of uh, Paris, which was about, see our range with, bomb, with bombs, our flying range was about four and a half hours, so, which meant four and a half hours to the target and back. These mission, this mission in particular was for a 48 foot bridge and it, was, and it was a place because we had disrupted all the other bridges north of that area all the, the Germans were starting to use that one as their main base for, for trans, transporting all their equipment and, and arms and so forth into, into that part of France. So uh, we were assigned that, that mission. We went out to that mission and uh, the mission took about four hours and 20 minutes altogether. As it turned out, we come back. And we, if we had four airplanes that couldn't make it back to the base. It was after D-Day that this, that this particular mission, uh, that we flew this particular mission. And uh, uh, one, one of the fellows who didn't have enough fuel to get across the channel had to land on the, uh, on the beaches. The beaches were just, it was about two, two or three days after the beaches were, were taken. And he was able to make a, a forced landing on the beach. One fellow had a ditch in the channel and the pilot's the only one who survived. He was a pretty robust fellow, about 6'3", weighed 250 pounds, and he was able to make it and swim to shore where the rest of his crew was lost. And two of the other airplanes crashed in, in England somewhere before they got home to their base. The rest of us got back to base. And of course, we came back with more fuel than anybody else again, because I used the same tactic after we dropped our bombs. I used the same tactic to save gasoline, and we got back fine. Now, we had to fly that mission three times because a 48-foot bridge can be built, rebuilt very fast. And sure enough, that's what happened. Now, as far as D-Day itself is concerned, D-Day had so many airplanes in the air, you had to be more aware of the airplanes in the air than anything else. Now, this in particular is the airplane I flew. I don't know how well you can see. You can come up here a little later and take a look at it. That's a B-26. And you notice the black and white stripes on it. 
Well, not one airplane had those black and white stripes on it June the 5th. June the 6th, every airplane in England, regardless, had black and white stripes. There wasn't one airplane that took off that day that didn't have black and white stripes. That was to make sure that the enemy, that we knew who was friendly and who was enemy. So every airplane that had black and white stripes was friendly. Every airplane that didn't have any stripes was enemy. And you can pass that around. There's another one here and so forth. So now, now there were so many airplanes in the air and so many ships in the sea. We had to fly three missions that day. But uh, our, the, the fellow who was flying that day, pilot, we didn't always fly with the same crew. Sometimes we piloted ourselves. Sometimes we, pilot, we were co-pilot for somebody and so forth. So the pilot who was flying uh, that day, we had to, t have to test your airplanes to make sure that they're ready to go. You have to run them up, just test run the airplanes, the engines, so forth. So he wasn't satisfied with it, and he shut the engine down, and that was the orders. Usually, if your engines, didn't, if your engines had more than 150 RPM drop, you wouldn't uh, you'd shut the engines down, call the mechanic. So we didn't fly that day. Out of all the airplanes that flew, I think ours is the only one that didn't fly. But there were three missions that day. So instead of flying three missions, we only flew two missions. As far as I know, we had very few fighters. Well, I never saw any fighters. During the entire time that I was over there, I was over there from April of 44 till March, I think, of 45, I only saw one enemy fighter. And that was one that was at a much lower level than I was, and he was going the other way. And it looked like it was the Messerschmitt uh, 202, which, is, which was the first jet that they had. The reason we didn't have any enemy fighters chasing us was because we had a higher kill rate against them than they had against us. Because of our gun emplacements, because of the, the type of formation that we flew, we flew formation, very tight formation. Thir when we went out on a regular mission, we went out 36 airplanes. There was one box, as they call it, of six airplanes here, six airplanes here, and six airplanes here, and another box the same way. And the two boxes would fly that way, but we flew quite, quite close. In fact, many times we flew wingtip over wingtip, where the co-pilot would fly if he was flying high, because the pilot couldn't see the, the airplane across the pilot's side. When, when he flew right wing, the pilot flew. So pilots and co-pilots usually shared a mission, neither one flew more than the other and so forth. And we flew these missions and as far as, far as our losses are concerned, out of 80,000 sorties that were flown, a sortie is one airplane over enemy territory. As far as the uh, sorties are concerned, there were 80,000 sorties flown by B-26s in the time that, the, that they were bombing there, we only lost 311 airplanes. 